Somewhere in communist Russia, a team of engineers were moving a large object through a desolate countryside, hoping to capture the minds of people everywhere by being the first to conquer outer space. The rocket was huge. Packed in its nose was a large ball with two radios inside. They had built it in total secrecy. are taking their last shots. Our space rocket is ready in the center of the Cosmodrome. The countdown begins. Now only a few moments remain. All eyes fix on the clock. 30 seconds. 10 seconds. The hand reaches vertical. A mighty roar. Our rocket vibrates. White hot flame gushes downward. And the great beast lifts slowly from the earth. We are about to create a new planet that we will call Sputnik. It is small, this first satellite, but after it, we will launch others. In the olden days, explorers like Vasco da Gama and Columbus had the good fortune to open up the terrestrial globe. Now we have the good fortune to open up space, and it is for those in the future to envy us our joy. It reached a speed of 18,000 miles an hour. Its flame went out, and in the silence of space, it joined the moon in orbit around the Earth. Then its casing opened, the springs snapped, and the nose cone was pushed out of the way. A ball with four antennae emerged to go it alone in the darkness of space. And a radio began to send a signal back to Earth. Humanity had entered the space age. When Sputnik left its Russian home, it began an incredibly fast journey east, and shortly passed over virtually all of the inhabited Earth, over the wide southern Atlantic Ocean, over the Sahara Desert in North Africa, over Jerusalem, and across vast stretches of the Pacific. It finally entered America, hugging the coast of California, and soon passed directly over Houston. This is Radio Moscow, and here is Houston. Our 
satellite Sputnik lifted at 22 hours 28 minutes Moscow time and entered orbit around the Earth. The first artificial Earth satellite in the world has now been created. This first satellite will today... It emanates radio signals every three-tenths of a second, charting its course as it streaks across the sky. Radio signals can be picked up on 20 and 40 megacycles as it circles the Earth once every... We are now to the Ladies and gentlemen, we are bringing to you the most important story of this century. Mankind's breakthrough into space. For the first time, mankind has reached for the stars and found them within his grasp. The Westinghouse Broadcasting Company filmed the first motion pictures of the Russian satellite. You are about to witness this historic event. Now here is a photograph released by the Soviets of the satellite, and this is a track of what you will see in the lower half of your television screen. So be sure that you watch very, very carefully. Now, there it is, I see it. about in the center of the screen in the lower third, you got we, the we moved the camera. the camera. The camera was moved now there. Now we start over again. Now we start over again, and the stars are in the background. This is a photograph of a monitor screen. Right, There's the object. Across the bottom. Now, that, that, across the bottom. Remarkable. About uh, in the middle of the screen now, I would say. Yeah, that is wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. Right now, it's north of Auckland, New Zealand, and moving southeast. It will be, in 10 minutes, about 1,500 miles north of Little America. And in about 24 minutes, it will be uh, over Santiago, Chile. And in about 50 minutes from now, it will be over Spain. It was cold and clear. We could see the Milky Way shimmering across the sky. I stood in my front yard, my family with me. The entire neighborhood, the entire city, in fact, the entire nation, it seemed, was standing outside, watching what the Russians had done. Just at the time the Russians had said, a tiny light appeared at the southwestern horizon and glided over our heads. Some of us cried. I stood in awe. Nothing man-made had ever been so global. Everyone knew it was there. Suddenly, space flight and space travel seemed possible. And now back tonight and trying for $20,000 are Eddie Hodges, the 10-year-old schoolboy, and his partner, Major John Glenn Jr., the Marine Corps jet pilot. Uh, what do you think of the Russian satellite, which is circling the Earth at 18,000 miles <laughs> per hour? Well, to say the least, George, they're out of this world, but... <laughs> uh, this is uh, really quite an advancement for not only the Russians, but for international science. I think we'd all agree on that. It's the first time anybody has ever been able to get anything out that far in space and keep it there for any length of time. And this is probably the first step toward space travel or moon travel, something we'll probably run into maybe in Eddie's lifetime here at least. <laughs> Eddie, would you like to take a trip to the moon? No, sir, I like it fine right here. <laughs> Soviet scientists launched a symbol of man's liberation from the forces which have hitherto bound him to Earth. It's an important day in human history. The launch of Sputnik is like the discovery of America by Christopher Columbus. The launch of Sputnik is one of the greatest scientific moments in world history. 
And in Moscow, the people of a great nation heard the news on their loudspeakers, read the news in their papers. The Russians, who have a constant feeling of inferiority in the modern world, became terrifically elated when their country was able to win the race in getting a satellite up into space. This was one time they had beaten the West in all its propaganda about higher living standards. The Sputnik was something the Russians could now boast about, and they did. <laughs> We were convinced as Americans, because we had so convincingly won World War II, that we were the dominant power in the world. We had to be. Missiles were being built. We were practicing as if there was going to be a third world war. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, here was this first man-made satellite being orbited by our arch enemy. So this was an enormous event. It took you from the realm of theoretical science fiction to reality. It was a reality that human beings could send artificial satellites into space. And that changed everything. It was one of those moments in history where all of a sudden, all of your thought processes changed. Senator Lyndon Baines Johnson of Texas described how he felt in his personal memoirs. Mrs. Johnson and I went outside. We did not speak. We walked with our eyes lifted skyward, straight in to catch a glimpse. And then we saw it. I felt uneasy. Texas, we live close with the sky. But now, in some way, our sky seemed alien. I said to myself that another nation had achieved superiority over this great country of ours. The thought shocked me. I rushed back to my house. I called my staff. I said, I wanted to make a complete inquiry into the state of our defenses. Lyndon Johnson telephoned me immediately. We started the preparedness investigating subcommittee hearings. I was calling everybody that could have any possible connection with this to see whether or not the United States was prepared for the Soviet Union dropping bombs on us from a satellite. The first thing Monday morning, political and military leaders appeared in print, on the radio and on TV, telling us that Sputnik was a threat to our security, that it was launched as an aggressive act. For years, Soviet Russia had been threatening to bury us. Sputnik, they said, was the first shot in a Cold War that could quickly become very hot. There is something new in the heavens. Something that has never been there before. It's called the Sputnik. We do not know now whether the satellite has direct military implications. Up until now, neither country could reach the other with bomb-carrying missiles. But Sputnik appeared to change that. And it now looked like the Russians could attack us we could do nothing to protect ourselves. The United States is depicted as being in a state of admiration, confusion, and surprise. And Russians are told that the American myth of a Soviet lag in science has been exploded. Russia getting into space really bothers me because it's making the Cold War between the Russia and the United States, you know, more intense. You know, there's going to be more tension between in world peace. Life magazine editors called Sputnik 
a devastating blow to the prestige of the United States. They compared it to the first shot at Lexington and Concord and urged Americans to respond like the Minutemen. Vatican said today, quote, Sputnik is a frightening toy in the hands of childlike men who are without morals, for it has broadcast no discovery like proof that God is in the heavens. The Federal Communications Commission warned that persons could be prosecuted for faking sounds as though they came from Sputnik, a hoax on the same frequency as the satellite said, this is a satellite. How long it will continue to whirl through the heavens is a subject of great speculation. Estimates range from a few days to one million years. In East Germany, a news agency said that the next Soviet space satellite would become a small permanent new planet in our solar system. The Reverend David Osborne said that the Russian satellite has proved the second coming of Christ is at hand. American scientists disagree over whether there is a secret code concealed in the radio beeps. Is it possible that it is transmitting a code, not just a beep signal? Yes, it's quite possible that it's transmitting a code, uh, but we don't uh, realize what the code is, of course. And I suppose if this is a code, it's a very fine one. Furthermore, this Sputnik will uh, have equipment that will jam our, our local television uh, stations, uh, radio stations, our early warning radar system, and then be in a position where the Russian, Russians can rebroadcast some of their propaganda. It'll come right into your home on your, on your television set the satellite's weight, 185 pounds. This huge size is what is impressing most scientists around the world today. If it is 180 pounds, I think it would astonish, or it, if it is that, it has astonished our scientists, I'd say that. If Sputnik was 184 pounds, that was alarming. It meant the rocket that launched it could be used as an intercontinental ballistic missile, ICBM that could potentially carry a nuclear bomb. The ambassador of Japan has graciously consented to appear at a later date in order that Youth Wants to Know may present a special program on the launching of the first Earth satellite by the Soviet Union. Excuse me, Jane. Oh, well, I'd like to know if uh, the people of my generation now have anything to fear by this uh, can this satellite be turned into some, into some kind of a dangerous weapon that will harm the future generation? The present satellite is not a guided missile, and uh, when some time passes, it will come to the tense uh, layers of the atmosphere, and it will burn out. But I'd still want, I still want to know, there isn't any danger then in something being turned from this missile by your country harming the ge uh, people of my generation? We don't have anything to fear then. Uh, one meaning very quickly read from the launching of the satellite is an ominous one. This is that the Russians have licked some of the toughest problems of rocket propulsion, the basis of the so-called ultimate weapon, the long-range ballistic missile. <laughs> Khrushchev said this kind of rockets which have taken Sputnik up could also carry missiles. They were using Sputnik to, to try to scare the United States, to scare Americans into the idea that they had uh, advanced beyond what we had done in, in missilery and rockets, and here they were, big and powerful. Up until now, the Cold War had been largely a war of words. But the threat that the Soviets had an ICBM now seemed a very real possibility. Ten years from now, Russia will be way ahead of us. Nuclear physicist Dr. Edward Teller intensified the feeling that we were at risk by comparing Sputnik to the most serious attack ever to hit America, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Said Senator Johnson, Soon, the Russians will be dropping bombs on us from space, like kids dropping rocks onto cars from freeway overpasses. It's frightening. Uh, we should find out what they're doing that we're not doing, and we should do something about it very quickly. I guess the American people are alarmed that a foreign country, especially an enemy country, can do this. And if we fear this. 
We feel that they have something out that majority of the people don't know about. This is the age of the rocket, which travels out, the satellite which surrounds all of us, and the missile which could destroy us. In the competition for leadership in space, in the race run by rocket, where is the finish line? Do we end up in a nuclear war, or do we try to live with the constant fear of what? Sputnik's a serious threat, if not to our immediate security, then to our sense of security. Probably no one here in the nation's capital would disagree with one thing that Senator Wiley said. We had better get on our toes. Sputnik revealed that the Soviets had a missile. But our worst fears were realized when just days later, they showed us that they had successfully tested a bigger, far more destructive H-bomb. To people around the world, America, the most scientifically advanced nation, now looked weaker. And during that very week, something else was happening at home that was hurting our reputation as much as Sputnik. The Russians said we were a people with a hatred for our own citizens just because of the color of their skin. And they had proof. In Little Rock, Arkansas, events were taking place that shocked people everywhere. Nine black students were trying to go to school in accordance with the law of the land. But people opposed to integrating schools had been violently trying to prevent them from entering all-white Central High. The world watched while white Americans screamed hate at black Americans. The Russians took advantage of this and proudly declared that Sputnik would fly directly over Little Rock, announcing to the world the exact hour it would pass overhead. To people in poorer nations, the Soviets represented the future, while America was bogged down with the problems of her past. There's something about America that makes me shout with joy. It's a land of opportunity for every girl and boy. There's something about our president that makes me shout hooray. In America, we all might be the president someday. Until that fall, 1957 had been great for America. In fact, throughout the 1950s, millions rose from the shadows of the Great Depression and World War II to become middle class, buying tens of millions of homes, automobiles, telephones, washing machines, refrigerators, and obtaining college degrees and home mortgages. The American dream was becoming reality for more and more of us. There's something about America that's wonderful to me. And you know what that something is. We are really free. The scenes which follow are taken from a communist propaganda film. This is what they are saying about you.
Behind the so-called Statue of Liberty, American capitalists are producing atomic bombs. Strikes are on the increase. A familiar sight, surplus milk and coffee thrown away so as to keep prices high. Here, the pampered dog of a millionaire. And here, the unemployed stand in line to get some slop. This is the real American way of life. Today, starvation and poverty. Tomorrow, chaos. Both sides were trying to win the war of words. The Soviets were telling the world that we had failed. That our best minds were focused on producing cars with monster tail fins, princess phones, and that we had to send the army, the legendary 101st Airborne, into an American city to make sure that children could go to public schools. The Soviet PR campaign centered on Sputnik was working. A Gallup poll showed that Sputnik had eroded American prestige in most foreign countries, including allies like Germany, France, Italy, and Japan. Suddenly there was a new dimension in the world, an astounding achievement, and it wasn't American. And we were all so unbelievably American, pro-American. We loved America. We tried to drive American cars. We tried to smoke American cigarettes. America was much loved. And this was the first sort of doubt. Can it be the insuperable, the brilliant America? People would talk about America with a passion and an enthusiasm that, alas, we have never repeated. Between what the Russians were saying and their Sputnik, it was all too much. We wanted reassurance from the president that we were safe, that he had a plan for us to regain our position and our power. President Eisenhower had proved himself as a military leader. He knew how to keep cool under pressure, how to stay focused. Within days of Sputnik, he called a press conference to calm the country down. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask me? President Smith of the United Press, uh, Russia has launched an Earth satellite. They also claim to have had a successful firing of the intercontinental ballistics missile, uh, none of which this country's done. Uh, I ask you, sir, uh, what are we going to do about it? I believe that uh, they, uh, I believe it'd be dangerous to predict what science is going to do in the next uh, 20 years. But it's going to be a very considerable time uh, in this uh, realm, just as in any other. The president didn't answer the question. He wasn't prepared for our reaction to Sputnik. He'd always been able to use his military background to keep us feeling safe. But the press, speaking for the public, wouldn't let Sputnik go. Hazel Markell of NBC. Uh, Mr. President, in light of the great faith which the American people have in your military knowledge and leadership, are you saying at this time uh, that uh, with the Russian satellite whirling about the world, you are not more concerned uh, about our nation's security? As far as the satellite itself is concerned, that doesn't raise my apprehensions, not one iota. I see nothing at this moment, at this stage of development, that is significant in that development as far as security is concerned. The mere fact that this thing orbits involves no duty of discovery to science. They knew it could be done, at least they say so, and they have for a long time. So that's no new discovery. So it, in itself, it imposes no additional threat to the United States. We wanted more from President Eisenhower. We knew him to be a steadfast commander, but this time, it seemed, he wasn't leveling with us. Speaking for most Americans, leading Democratic opponents and others criticized his apparent lack of concern about the risks we were facing. The people of the United States have been humiliated. They're disturbed and they're unhappy. I see nothing wrong in acknowledging Russia's accomplishment, but I see a great deal wrong with kidding ourselves. Not just our pride, but our security is at stake. 
Our security was at stake. It seemed that almost daily, Soviet leaders told us that they were going to annihilate us. Premier Nikita Khrushchev spoke aggressively because he feared America and our threats that we would destroy them. He was determined to protect his nation by standing up to us, by letting us know that if we attacked them, they would destroy us with their ICBMs. The communists are red fascists. On our side, government leaders had been telling us for a decade that the Soviets were evil and ungodly. That they were a serious threat to our way of life, not just because they had missiles, but because of what they stood for. This boy will grow up acutely aware that there are forces of evil. Communism is a word he is learning to understand. How we meet the communist challenge depends on you. The communists are embarked on a worldwide campaign to take over the world. The communist bloc would like to see the entire world under communist domination. The basic idea of the communism that people must be equal, that the rich people have to share their wealth with the poor, and then we will build a society where everybody will have their share. So it was the same what the Jesus Christ, Christ told 2,000 years ago, and he was crucified for his words. So in reality, the first communist was Jesus Christ. Coexistence to a communist means nothing. Uh, you cannot coexist with one who is dedicated to your complete and utter destruction. Of course, uh, Soviet Union was evil empire to the United States. United States was the same evil empire to the Soviets because they wanted to destroy our country, our social democracy. It was the same feeling on the both sides. Unless we understand and work effectively for the principles upon which our American way of life is founded. The structure will crumble, and our heritage of freedom will perish. a special report on the Russian launching of a second Earth satellite. And now to guide this report here in New York is NBC News commentator Merrill Muller. Good afternoon. A dog knocked a goat right out of the world's attention today. In a masterpiece of propaganda timing, the Soviet Union announced it had launched Sputnik No. 2, carrying a live dog. This is reportedly history's first space traveler. Moscow reports this morning that the dog in the new Sputnik is in satisfactory condition, and the Reds hint that she may be parachuted safely back to Earth. The space dog arrives well. The Red Sputnik. 
The dude barking his way around the earth every 102 minutes has one Russian new respect. A British editor asked me half-jokingly, how does it feel to be the citizen of a second-rate power? Behind the scientific success lies a grim military warning. Confirmed now by Anglo-American scientists, the rocket that launched Sputnik No. 2 is capable of carrying a ton and a half hydrogen bomb warhead more than 5,000 miles to a target. The kind of thing that a month ago would have sounded like a joke, but in Washington now, anyone who cares to laugh at this does so at his own risk. The Russians are talking about shooting up something that will hit the moon and possibly even make some kind of mark on it, visible from the Earth. These Russians, who we had stereotyped as a crude people, barely able to master a tractor, were years ahead of us. When that shaggy dog gets back from outer space, can we all go out and have another race? Will he still free the coon or just howl at the moon? When that shaggy dog gets back from outer space. In spite of these fears, Laika captured the limelight. Everyone wanted the first living creature in space to return safely to Earth. Laika became more famous than any actor or athlete of her time. Oh, they'll pin a red, red ribbon in his hair. For being the only dog that's been up there, he'll be the talk in every town when that Sputney comes back down. For he has been the highest in the air. Change to Laika, Laika cigarettes, made of the best Eastern tobaccos, known far and wide for their fine flavor. Gentlemen, it appears that the whole world's concerned about little Mutnik flying around out there in space. Dr. Speck, what can you tell us about her chances for survival? Well, I uh, believe her chances for survival are probably quite good. The Russians have not said so officially, but they have indicated strongly an effort will be made to bring the dog back to Earth alive. Prayers were said for the dog, and people were asked to observe a minute's silence each day with special thoughts for her early and safe return to Earth. From Singapore to Cincinnati, they've risen in a chorus of protests. Marches on Soviet embassies and various capitals are planned, and the National Canine Defense League of Britain has called dog lovers to a minute of silence each day. But then it dawned on the world that there was no provision for Laika's return, and that she was sent into orbit to die. The Soviets admitted that she would soon run out of oxygen. Millions reacted not to the missile threat, but to Laika's impending doom. Keep your chin up, little dog. You deserve a monument, you pioneer in space. We can only pray in this time of aloneness and suffering that God will be merciful and, and speed the end. This voiceless cry of mercy as this satellite spans the earth should be long remembered as a symbol of the torture the animal world must go through. Months later, the spacecraft carrying the lifeless body of its valiant little pioneer fell out of orbit and was incinerated during reentry. The Russian people did build a monument in her honor. The launching of Sputnik number two is not something to be taken lightly and in a casual manner. It seems to me that the time is at hand now for the president not merely to take the country into his confidence as he has indicated by a series of speeches, but more importantly to take the Congress into his confidence to tell us all of the facts. Here we are having a country that's not supposed to be able to build refrigerators or anything, putting satellites up there, and we can't, we're not. Where is our pride? Where, where are we? Why don't we have a satellite up there? Five weeks after Sputnik, 
the president received an urgent top secret memo from a CIA operative inside the Soviet Union. Sputnik 2 has materially increased the threat to our security. Sputnik's weight of 1,100 pounds proves that they can send us an H-bomb. It is vitally important that the United States launch a satellite at the earliest possible moment. This is the only way we can truly protect ourselves. With the pressure from the CIA report and from Congress and the public, the president felt he had to do something. He announced that very shortly, America would launch its first satellite, Vanguard. In desperation, the United States looked to the Vanguard. Project Vanguard is to circle the Earth 300 miles high, sending back information about the cosmic unknown. The man-made moon will ride a giant rocket into space. 72 feet long, the missile will travel five miles per second. Vanguard would launch a satellite the size of a grapefruit which the press pointed out was puny, much smaller than Sputnik 1. The president's decision to go with Vanguard was difficult for him to make because the military had several rockets that they said were ready for launch. Redstone, Uncle Sam's largest ballistic missile, goes on exhibition at New York's famous Grand Central Terminal. Redstone, a rocket built by the Army, was ready to go but the president refused to use it. He was concerned that a rocket developed by the military might provoke a new arms race that could cause the Soviets to expand their missile program and build bigger hydrogen bombs. Werner von Braun, at 27, head of the German rocket development during World War II. Also, the Army's rocket program was headed by Werner von Braun, would work for Hitler. Von Braun was the creator of the V-2 rocket, which the Nazis had launched on London and had killed thousands of civilians. President Eisenhower was struggling to find the fastest way to put a satellite into orbit. In an effort to help, scientifically oriented boys joined rocket clubs. restore American prestige, they would build and launch homemade rockets. More and more teenagers are passing up rock and roll for a rocket roll. Sister Dunn Scotus, a physics teacher, supervises members of the Austin, Minnesota Rocket Society attempting to send a mouse along. We wanted our country to catch up. Uh, with the Russians and then we wanted to just keep on going forever. We just felt like someday what we were doing was going to help the United States to, to be number one in space. I was just completely uh, fascinated and was doing my best to get rockets as high as I possibly could. My goal was to get a rocket into the stratosphere if I could. Inspired by Sputnik to build my own rockets, you know, so that uh, ended up with some chemistry experiments in the basement that went wrong. <laughs> yeah, I exploded this rocket mixture and I burned my eyebrows off and my mother was horrified. They really weren't rockets, they were pipe bombs with fins. It's amazing I didn't uh, kill myself. Uh, they were very, very dangerous. Two of my Nobel friends have fingers missing from, so I, I've got all 10 of them, so I was very careful. Fire. The promise of great things to come from future partners of space. America's satellite launching vehicle is the Focus, the first U.S. rocket with satellite ever fired. Newsmen from all over the world were flown down for the big turkey shoot. At the launching site, they were given a play-by-play -play account. They witnessed each tiny detail of the usually top-secret preparation. It was carnival time at Cape Canaveral. All through the day and night, thousands of people thronged the nearby beaches and jetties, 
waiting eagerly for the big moment. This is Charles Von Friend reporting from Cape Canaveral. Reporters and photographers have gathered here throughout the night and early morning. Now it is almost noon. We expect the Project Vanguard missile carrying the first United States Earth satellite to be launched momentarily. Inside the blockhouse, the tension steadily mounted. Minus 10, 9, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Vanguard started sounding like the moan of some massive dinosaur. Fire filled its nozzles. It spit flame at first, then built with great crescendo to a tremendous howl. It ripped itself loose from its chains and began to rise slowly. We all rose with it. Oh, God, no! Somebody screamed. I don't see it. I think the launching has been unsuccessful. It seemed as if the gates of hell had it's opened black cloud of before our unbelieving eyes. The giant began to topple. No the it took just seven seconds to set back a nation's pride. But our first attempt to launch an Earth satellite has apparently ended in failure. down here in this gully. You'll find other bits and pieces of it scattered out here in the smoking debris on the other side of the road. Normally, after a launch, that launching pad is as clean as a dinner plate, and you can see what it looks like now. Good evening, everybody. Coast to Coast, Douglas Edwards reporting. At Cape Canaveral, a dull thud heard round the world. The London Daily Express called it Kaputnik. The Daily Mail, Footnik goes the U.S. satellite. The Sun, stay Putnik. The Daily Herald, oh, what a flopnik. This headline was proudly reprinted by the Soviets. It went on and on. The American Stock Exchange closed to prevent frantic selling. Russian PR kept the vanguard's flames burning. Khrushchev added insult to injury when he addressed the Supreme Soviet. Our Sputniks are circling the world. Now, with America's failure, they will not be able to stop the forward march of communism. President Eisenhower now felt he had no choice but to call on the Army and Werner von Braun. Though he was against the use of a military rocket, the public and the press were desperate for an American success. And Werner von Braun said that his rocket was ready to go. announcement for you. We've been assigned the mission of launching a scientific Earth satellite. I promised the Secretary of the Army that we would be ready in 90 days or less. Let's go, Warner. For years, they had begged for this chance. But to put up a satellite within the deadline would require an unparalleled crash program. This is a rebuilt Redstone, a 200-mile missile, carrying, instead of a warhead, the Explorer. A six-foot bullet, only inches across, crammed with electronic gear. 30 pounds of payload. Cape Canaveral, Florida. Friday, 31 January, the weather is clear. General Madeiras orders launch at 10.30 that night. 
the Explorer 1 satellite is carefully fitted into place, like a glittering jewel in a metallic set. Okay, check the utility room fuel vapors and notify the blockhouse when we're clear to start generator. The beams of powerful searchlights light up the missile. Truly the star of one of the greatest suspense dramas of our time. Close the blockhouse doors. Close the doors. We're counting. It's T-minus 35. Man your stations. No talking, please. The countdown to explore a one. Okay, we'll start now. Connect assembly two and three. Connect assembly two and three. Connect assembly two and three. Connect assembly two and People were crying there after it finally went up, and, and you were hearing everybody yell, go, 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 you know, as it got farther and farther, and then it got dimmer and dimmer. The rocket just grew dimmer and dimmer, and it was gone. President Eisenhower says that he's been informed that we have successfully put a satellite into orbit. Americans stand a little straighter. They walk a little more confidently. America was finally in the race and took a moment to celebrate, to go wild with space fever. Hundreds of American cities held parades. Songs were written. I'm gonna build me a satellite. Walt Disney produced new TV programs. The Boy Scouts offered a space merit badge. Students went on field trips to planetariums and celebrated space days. Toy companies promoted satellite and rocket tours. Come in ideal countdown control. Ready for second launching. Three, two, one, blast off! People around the country honored the men that had finally gotten America into and space. Van Allen, Von Braun, top spaceman scientists who turtled democracy into the space age. They held a news conference, and Von Braun and Pickering and Van Allen held a backup explorer over their heads. And then America was at their feet. German scientist Werner von Braun had become America's rocket superstar. If we were to start today on an organized and well-supported space program, I believe... His partner, Army General John Medeiros, was the man who led the rocket team. Both men took this opportunity to break traditional military silence and began to speak out publicly about how they wanted the American military to take the lead and dominate space. Major General John B. Medeiros is the commander of the 5,000-man Army team that shot the satellite Explorer into space. Thank you so much on behalf of the team, Gary. Well, General, since a Jupiter C went into orbit, you have said that the next major war will be fought out of this world, and you feel our goal should be the, quote, domination of space. Is that true? Yes, that's right. 
Of course, I don't believe we're going to do it tomorrow, but it will be very soon, I think. Gentlemen, the conquest of outer space is the greatest technological challenge of the age in which we live. The first decisive step in the conquest of space will be the placing of an object into an orbit wherein it will indefinitely circle the Earth. Uh, you uh, are known as an advocate of transporting army troops by ballistic rockets. Could you uh, elaborate a little on the army thinking? We think the ballistic missile is a very suitable form of transportation. A nuclear war, you have to think not only in great depth of the battlefield, but also... They have this dream of turning space into a platform for war, of using missiles to send people, send troops around the world in tubes like sardines in a can. They were looking at space as the next big weapons platform. The day will come when perhaps our major battles will be space battles instead of air battles. Uh, I certainly couldn't predict exactly when that'll be, but I'm sure it will come in the future. I believe that uh, there's a definite possibility for launching guided missiles from an orbit to targets on the ground. The conquest of space will probably be of greater importance than we can begin to realize at the present time. And if we do not expend the thought, the effort, and the money required, then another more progressive nation will. It is quite possible that an aggressor nation that dominates space will then dominate the world. We just can't let that happen. Sending soldiers to fight in space was going to be hugely expensive. Military leaders teamed up with top scientists to try to get funding from Congress. So in the first step, while we still have a chance of catching up with the Russians, we must use what we do have. And this vehicle here is a design which provides for people to go out into space. All right, I'm asking now, you've got a decision now to go full steam ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, but you don't have the money? We don't have the money. What? How can you do it then without the money? Good question, sir. It's high time that we, as a nation, face the facts of life. The people must be told the gravity of a situation and what is required to strengthen our defenses and to regain our respect in the community of nations. The responsibility for these policy decisions rests primarily with the President, the Department of Defense, and the civilian departments of the military services. At his White House press conference, President Eisenhower is questioned on charges made in the current defense debate that his administration is too complacent and too concerned with the economy. Ike's reply indicates the increasing bitterness the defense debate has lately taken on. I get tired of saying that defense is to be made an excuse for wasting dollars. I don't believe we should pay one cent for defense more than we have to. But I do say this, our defense, our defense is not only strong... President Eisenhower fought against the development of weapons in space. From the start of his presidency, he had been speaking out against the uncontrolled growth of weapons that he said would fuel an arms race. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed those who are cold and are not put. The cost of one modern heavy bomber is this, a modern brick school in more than 30 cities. Opponents in Congress use this issue to attack the president. We could do more and we could do it quicker if the national attitude were more appropriate to the threat and if more money were available calling him asleep at the switch, hoping to undermine his popularity. It's pretty bad. The president has control over the agencies of government. That means he can organize and he can administer if he will. But you have to have the will and you have to wake up to the fact that the country is in dire trouble. It may be important to have a balanced budget, 
But I suggest that it is much more important to have the balance of power in this world in the hands of the United States and the free nations. A balanced budget and a country that is under the threat of Soviet domination doesn't make much sense to me. Well, General, could you tell us just where our explorer is right at this moment? Yes, I think I can show you, Gary. Oh, great. Right now, it's right in the South Atlantic on the way towards the, the southern part of Africa and then coming up across this way. Although the Soviets threatened us by placing two Sputniks over our heads, the Russian military now said that our explorer satellite was a threat to their security and they reacted by calling for a renewed weapons buildup. This was exactly what Eisenhower had feared. The Russian military now put pressure on Khrushchev to commit the funds to build space weapons. Many of these generals knew him, and they thought that he will be on their side, building more tanks, more uh, increasing the army. He told, we don't need big army. He told, we don't need tanks, because nobody will attack us if they know that we will destroy them with our missiles. For us, missiles were survival. If you will have enough missiles that will be threatening Americans with destruction, they will never attack us. In Moscow, Communist leader Khrushchev repeated his earlier remarks that Russia's intercontinental ballistic missile makes manned airplanes obsolete for defense, and they might as well be put in museums. Let's not fool ourselves. This may be our last chance to provide the means of saving Western civilization from annihilation. On April 7th, President Eisenhower received another top secret report from a CIA officer in Russia. To the president, I saw Khrushchev, and he admitted that both Sputniks were launched on ICBMs. He is convinced that the US does not have one and that the Russians are ahead of us in the missile field. He confidently said that they could hit anything in the United States using their ICBMs and that the balance of strength has changed in their favor. The army grew from two and a half million to 5.5 million. And Khrushchev has dilemma. Really, war is inevitable. Or we can deal with that people. But we have to be strong. And we have shown them that we are strong. And was fear on the both sides. explosion or not. That's that type of, uh, you know, feelings of terror. Something's got to change. Something's got to change because it's just not a matter of leadership anymore. We're behind. And if we're behind in something that is a life and death matter, that's unacceptable. And I, and, and f as, as much as it, 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 it's happened in the past, fear changed people, made people think seriously that this was a crucial moment with regards to the history of the United States. Lenin put it this way, it does not matter if three quarters of mankind is destroyed. All that counts 
is that the last quarter is coming. There isn't much time. Fill the bathtub, the sink, and every pot you've got with water. And if you hear a siren, turn the current to the house off the main switch. In May, a Gallup poll indicated that Americans believed a war with Russia was likely. Keep off of the phone. No calls, no loading up at the supermarket. Stay in the house and keep the radio going. And that it could kill seven in ten Americans. In dozens of films, Hollywood and our Office of Civil Defense fed this fear. Group 12 1201 North Europe time. Cheese. Beer. Ah. to know that maybe you're going to die within the hour. Hard to understand. such an attack, there would be no survivors of the blast. Each of us would dispense a dog tag, which we were told by this old teacher, somewhat tactlessly, could withstand the heat of a thousand degrees centigrade, made not to melt. Unfortunately, our skin disintegrated about 900 degrees before. But we, we had the comfort of knowing we could be identified in the event we were burned beyond recognition in a nuclear holocaust. She actually put it that way. The possibility of conflict became even more real. When an atomic bomb dropped on American soil, suddenly it was clear that an accident anywhere in the world could provoke a nuclear war. An atomic bomb breaks loose from a mounting shackle in a B-47 jet over Florence, South Carolina, plummets to earth, causing a sensational freak accident. In the Greg yard, the blast tore a 35-foot deep crater. The accident set off a chain of alarm and criticism around the world. In Britain, it aroused new controversy over nuclear weapons. Moscow cited it as the type of mishap that could spark a war. If nuclear war was coming, Americans had to be prepared for it. On June 10th, the Office of Civil Defense conducted a national drill to test our preparedness. Tens of millions of Americans participated. The most rigorous test of America's civil defenses, a simulated hydrogen bomb attack that strikes at 75 key targets from coast to coast. Enemy aircraft are over the illusion. Heading south-southwest. Prepare for total disaster. The drill had two purposes to show us how to protect ourselves in the event of nuclear war, and to show the Soviets that we were strong enough to survive a nuclear attack and fight back. Nike missiles around New York are raised into firing position. United States prepared for war. At 10.35, the banshee wail of the siren echoes the warning. The city prepares for survival. Keep your radio tuned to this frequency. There is a traffic plan for the evacuation of the city. All cars in the downtown area must follow the green light. Walk, do not run to your nearest shelter. Walk, do not run to your nearest shelter. New Yorkers have been conditioned by practice alerts. They know what to do. Turn off your electricity and gas. Fill pots and pans with water. Obey your civil defense wardens. Meanwhile, from the Pentagon and other key points, top defense figures are airlifted to secret control centers where they would 
direct America's defense and counterattack. In 1946, the Soviets also produced civil defense films to convince their citizens that they could survive a nuclear war. The films told Russians how to put on their gas masks and how to tamp down radiation by hand. The same like in the United States, they taught us what you have to do. And we have the joke that if you will see this bright explosion somewhere on the sky, you have to fall on the ground, put some uh, white material on top of you, and slowly crawl towards cemetery. And the question, why slowly? Because you must not create the panic. Well, individuals apparently have been reluctant to build shelters. Do you think the government's going to ultimately have to take care of this? Well, we have, we have, uh, we have submitted such a program, as I say, within the executive branch of the government. However, I would urge individuals who can afford it to build shelters and build them right now. This is the home of Jim and Carol Sweet. They are one of seven families in Washington, D.C., which has a bomb shelter in their basement. It's a concrete dome type of bomb shelter protected by this three-quarter inch steel door. And uh, Jim and Carol are inside now getting a bunk ready. Uh, Jim, is there room for one more in there? There is one in there. <laughs> How do you come in? Backwards? Frontwards? Does it give you a more secure feeling? Yes, it does, because uh, I know that no matter what happens, at least I've got some place to go to and I have some place to take my children. And I don't feel like I'm just going to be sitting there waiting for something to happen with no protection whatsoever. And I don't think that it would ever come to them just saying, either you surrender or you're going to bomb me. But, uh, no, I, I wouldn't rather surrender them because they're atheists and they have a godless way of life. Weapons of precise yield, accurate delivery systems, small sizes where necessary, in abundance, and all matched with an adequate airlift. As the fear grew, so did America's missile stockpile. And Congress now approved the building of thousands more missiles within just 12 months. Throughout 1958, America and Soviet Russia conducted more above-ground nuclear weapons tests than ever before. One test every three days. Anything that we could conceive, however dark and dangerous, we assumed that this equivalent scientists on the Soviet side could conceive, and they did the same for us. If conceivable, then wouldn't those terrible, evil people on either side do it, try it, test it? If so, then shouldn't we? And Khrushchev, he told that nuclear weapons will be never used, except if they push us into the corner when we have nothing to do, then push the button. So he told it's very important not to push the enemy in the corner. And then he told if they will start the war, we will have to say to them in advance, first day we will use our nuclear capability. I must say to you and acknowledge to you that in my opinion, the civilization Yea, the Christian civilization that you and I know and love stands in greater danger today than it has in 20 centuries. One of his uh, main 
economic advisors came uh, to the president and they were discussing uh, the aftermath of the atomic war and uh, this individual was going on a great length about um, uh, reintroducing the dollar and stabilizing the currency and Eisenhower shook his head and said, you don't understand, There's gonna, we're going to be eating worms. Russia now ordered an all-out military mobilization in preparation for war. Their arsenal grew by hundreds of nuclear weapons. And to prove their capability, they tested the largest above-ground hydrogen bomb ever exploded. A bomb, if it yielded 10 megatons, would destroy New York City. And the fallout alone would kill everybody from New York to Boston, including Boston. The belief of the Rockefeller Group is that we have to build up our missile force. We also require the modernization of the Army divisions and in the airlift to get them into trouble spots quickly. We should not concern ourselves so much with one single life. Somebody makes a demagogy talk about a missile or somebody else about a different submarine or a piece of radar. The nicety of judgment comes in, what do we need? Get that, get that by all means, and get no, more, get no more. Eisenhower was trying to reduce American fears and quiet calls by military and congressional leaders for an arms buildup. But in spite of his statements, Congress approved a multitude of weapons, including smaller atomic weapons designed to fight what was called a limited war. When they started, the United States built the nuclear cannons. The Soviets also designed. The commander of the ground forces came to Khrushchev with plan and told, we have to have produce them in hundreds of thousands. It who will decide to use them? The division commander. He will start the nuclear war. It will be, it will be not my decision. It's too dangerous, too expensive. It will, we have to. We show them twice a year on the military parade on the Red Square. It's enough for Americans. It's enough for you, General. It was fortunate for the planet that at a time when the world was headed towards disaster, two superpowers were led by former military men who were both determined to decrease the arms race and the threat of nuclear war. There was two leaders who could say to their military, you don't need this. And they had this discussion in Camp David when the Eisenhower told Khrushchev, my general's pushing me for new investment in military because Soviets producing this weapons. And Khrushchev told my marshals do the same because, because Americans, they, they destroy this. And then the Eisenhower smiled at Khrushchev and told, maybe we'll sign the personal treaty between two of us against our military. We and other nations have a great responsibility to promote the peaceful use of space. At a critical moment, he knew the difference between strength that comes from peace rather than the strength of war. Eisenhower was in favor of having an organization that was um, a civilian. Uh, Eisenhower did not want a military uh, organization. He wanted a civilian agency. And it was remarkable because it went up, the Sputnik went up on October the 4th, 57. And by July of 58, we had NASA set up. Be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America. We hereby declare that it is the policy of the United States 
that activities in space should be devoted to peaceful purposes for the benefit of all mankind. The Congress further declares that space activities shall be directed by a civilian agency and shall be conducted so as to contribute materially to the expansion of human knowledge. To ensure that NASA was controlled by civilians, Eisenhower moved funding for all manned space programs from the military to NASA. Last week, the president transferred Von Braun's Huntsville team and their Saturn project to the National Aeronautics and Space Agency. When told of their transfer to NASA, Von Braun and others threatened to quit. When Eisenhower threatened back, Von Braun joined NASA to work on sending an astronaut into space and returning him safely to Earth. As Christmas approached, Eisenhower attempted to pull off one of the most daring acts of any American president. He developed a top secret project codenamed SCORE with a team of 88 hand-picked civilians and soldiers. They built an audio tape player designed to be launched into space that would play a personal message from the president that everyone, everywhere could hear. Eisenhower was so determined to keep SCORE a secret, it would be launched without the awareness or approval of Congress, the military, or even the CIA. Less than a minute remains in the countdown. Eight, seven, six, five. Newsman Jay Barbary saw it all. It launched at 6.02 p.m. December 18th. Once the satellite was in orbit, a radio signal was sent from the ground to start the tape recorder that keeps playing over and over a message of season greetings from the United from the President of the United States. President Eisenhower said to the press, that's one of the most astounding things. Maybe the next thing they'll do is televise pictures. After SCORE, many government leaders were furious at what Ike had done. They called SCORE an expensive stunt, orchestrated by a president in trouble. But it was not. SCORE symbolized the future. For Eisenhower had given us the world's first communication satellite. You know, when we're talking about the beginning of the space age, of the Sputniks, it is the same as the Christopher Columbus discovering America. You just entered the new world without real understanding of the consequences. So we were very proud that we first opened this door in space. The, the main reaction, I, I hope we learn, I don't know if we will, that Sputnik really was meant to be a peaceful evidence of our scientific capabilities. If we can detach Sputnik from rockets with warheads. That would be a great way to end this 50 years. Beep, 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 beep. Here comes the satellite. Beep, 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 beep. And now it's out of sight. Beep, 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 beep. Around the earth it goes. Beep, beep. Science 
made it whiz! It must go at least five miles a second or it'll never stay up. Some of them can go around the Earth in only an hour and a half. Beep, 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 beep. Around the Earth it goes. Beep, 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 beep. And that's how science grows. Well, my great granddaddy had a horse and a buggy. My granddaddy had one, too. My daddy got him an automobile. But he'll want I'm gonna do. I'm gonna build me a satellite. Build me a satellite. And rock around the moon. Rock around the moon. I'm gonna build me a satellite. Build me a satellite. And rock around the moon. Rock around the moon. Tell the chicks on Mars I'm a coming up to see them soon. 